Uh, we're going to be talking about Ossix bone, which is a mineralized collagen sponge that we can use for a wide variety of procedures. As you can see, Ossix bone comes in three different sizes. And at first glance, it really looks very similar to a lot of the other socket grafting materials that are out there, um, collagen sponges and things like this. Um, and if you start to handle this material, you really start to see how different this material is. When a typical socket uh, plug um, gets hydrated, you know, it gets very, very mushy very, very quickly. This material is really very, very different because it comes in almost a chalky consistency. And the way that we use it, which I'll show you in detail, is by hydrating it in the patient's blood. So it's a mineralized collagen sponge that's composed of uh, porcine crosslink collagen interspersed with hydroxyapatite. And so this really allows for this great environment for vascularization of our bone graft materials. And it also allows us to keep that space maintained while that blood clot and that bone graft has a chance to um, uh, mature. Now, the science behind this product is really, really drives the success of this material. This is a, like I mentioned, cross-linked collagen and it's cross-linked using a glymatrix technology, which basically means that we're using naturally occurring sugars, ribose in this case, to cross-link the collagen. And so this really enhances the durability of the material and the ability of the material to turn into regenerated bone. Um, it comes in three sizes. This has really been my go-to, this five by five by 10. And actually I use this same size in each of the three cases that I'm gonna show you today. We already maybe have heard of this Glymatrix technology. Um, if you've ever used Osix Plus before or Osix Volumax, two of the other products in this Osix portfolio, um, both of those products are really uh, been the mainstay of my regenerative procedures. Um, Osix Plus as a very thin collagen membrane that's super resistant to degradation. And then Osix Volumax, which is a two millimeter thick collagen scaffold that we're using for some sockets, but also um, as a scaffold in cases where we don't add bone graft material, we're still able to um, regenerate lost buckle plates around implants um, and to really thicken up the soft tissue. Um, and because of this cross-linking technology, we know that this material is actually mineralizing over time. And so it really makes sense for, for Datum, the manufacturer of these Ostex products to have come out with a bone graft material. And this material is what we're really gonna focus on today, this Ostex bone material. As you can see, when you're using this material, it looks much similar to a lot of the socket materials that we've used in the past. But like I mentioned earlier, this material will actually be super resistant to degradation and will stick around long enough for the body to regenerate bone in its place. Um, but it's very important when you're handling this material to get a feel for the material first. So that's what I'm gonna try to do in the next couple of slides is just basically show you my advice in terms of handling things that will improve your, your long-term outcomes. Um, we all know for simple sockets, we, you know, the most important part of that procedure is probably to degranulate completely and get some nice bleeding in that socket. We then insert the ostex bone into that socket completely dry. And what you'll notice is that this material is very hydrophilic. And so the blood from the socket will quickly infiltrate into this material. And then all of a sudden it goes from this chalky type consistency to a much more spongy consistency. And it actually will expand as it gets hydrated. Um, the next step is usually when we're placing a bone graft would be to pack this material really tightly. And I think it's very key for us to realize the benefit of this material is that it has that nice spacing for, for vascularity and for angiogenesis. And so while we're, we're, we're going to place this material at the original crest of bone, we're not going to really um, strongly condense it into the socket because we like the, the, the space and that environment that it creates for new bone formation. So I'll use the back end of a periosteal elevator, or I'll use a condenser with just some gently, gentle force just to get that material right at the level of the crest. And that's really gonna be key, not to overpack this material. And remember, because it expands, it's really nice for the sockets because at the apical extent of the socket, it's very um, easy for that material to expand and fill those voids. So you don't end up with any dead space. Um, this part of the procedure is my favorite because rather than doing any sort of fancy suturing, we can really do the most simple possible 
um, suturing just to allow the soft tissues to, to passively close. And as you can see here, I left this case open probably four or five millimeters because I'm not putting any tension on the flat margin. And there's a lot of different ways that we could suture this material. Like I said, single interrupted, um, you can use a figure eight or a reverse mattress. But the nice thing is because I can use this material in a lot of cases without using the addition of a membrane, um, I don't have to worry about me pulling or biting my membrane out of the socket. So that really makes it much easier for us to to manage sockets and not have to complicate cases that really have very simple solutions like I'm showing you. One of my biggest um, pieces of advice for you if you've never used this material is not to handle the material too much when it's dry because like I said, it is very chalky and it will tend to start breaking apart on you. Uh, the first time you use this, this will undoubtedly happen um, just know that's okay. It doesn't matter if it crumbles, you can still use it just as you would if it wasn't crumbled. Uh, I just think that the benefits of the material are that you're not dealing with a particular graft. And so it's nice when it stays together and there's just a lot less um, manipulation that you have to do. Um, for sockets that are intact or nearly intact, you know, a three, four, five millimeter distance even, I'm finding that we can use this material because of its nice space maintaining properties without the addition of a collagen membrane. And so that's really very, very nice and really simplifies the procedure for us. Let's look at a case from start to finish, one of the first cases I completed. And this is a typical case where I would love to place an immediate implant, but for financial reasons, that wasn't in the cards for the patient. And to be honest, it was a little bit of a relief because as you can see, there's very little bone apical to that socket for me to get good primary stability. And so what we'll do is just like in the previous case, after fully degranulating the site, will place our ossix bone passively into the socket and you'd be surprised how quickly that blood will just seep through and, and make this material um, bright red and spongy. At that point, like in the previous case I showed you, we'll just gently um, compress this material so that it's right at the level of the crest. And then again, some chromic gut resorbable sutures um, just to passively get closure, maybe help keep that material in place just a little bit. Now this is great because that shows perfectly at about two and a half, three weeks, how despite not having any primary closure here, because this material is so biocompatible, we have some nice closure. We have um, secondary healing here. And most importantly, we have this beautiful band of thick carotinized tissue now at four months when we're ready to place our implants. At this point, you can see I placed a crestal incision and I expose the alveolar crest and you can see here how I can place my implant in that perfect ideal position with all that beautiful remaining bone that I have. And as you notice, very little remnants of any um, particulate bone graft material. Now, I love showing this picture because this patient um, did have a very high and wide smile. And so she was wearing a partial and it was very important to her that no one ever saw her without her teeth. And so when I placed this implant, I actually decided to just bury it and let her wear her partial so I wouldn't have to do many adjustments there. And I just thought it was so interesting because I did not bury this implant um, subcrestally. This implant was placed right at the level of the crest. And when I went back to do the uncovery about three and a half months later, you can clearly see that we have new mineralized uh, material, mineralized bone material um, over, those over the, the neck of that implant. And so it really tells you how this material continues to mature over time. And in a case like this, where I previously maybe would have used a particulate bone graft with a resorbable membrane, um, raising, raising maybe bigger flaps to get access, I'm able to complete this and get really good predictability in a very, very simple fashion. Now, sockets can be treated a lot of different ways, um, but I just think it's really important for all of us to appreciate the benefits of not raising big flaps and doing minimal treatment, or I should say minimally invasive treatment when possible. Because as you can see here, we didn't move the mucogingival junction. We have this beautiful increased zone of cretinized tissue, and we're really preserving the blood supply to the buccal plate by not elevating the periosteum. So we all know that this is really a great way to go. Of course, a lot of the cases that present to my clinic, and I'm sure yours as well, present with a lot more complicating factors. So here's another case of a little bit more advanced socket grafting, um, where the patient presented with a buccal fistula that was draining. She had uh, quite a bit of swelling and discomfort. And taking a look at the x-ray, you can see we have a 
tooth with a history of a root canal and a recurrent uh, periapical radiolucency. And in these cases, like I mentioned in the last slide, I do try to keep things minimally invasive. So we'll extract the tooth without a flap, and then we'll go ahead and start degranulating and bone sounding to see where the buccal plate is. Of course, in this case, it wasn't so simple because this defect really started to expand as I got more apical. And as you can see here, we had quite a large fenestration. And in these cases, I just prefer to place a vertical incision because I really find the most important part of the, the success of these procedures is going to be completely degranulating these areas. And so by raising a little bit of a, a larger flap here to get access to that defect, I can be 100% certain that I've completely degranulated the area. I'll go ahead and take that five by five by 10 ossix bone, place it into the socket, just like in the previous case. And you can see I have some great bleeding here. So this is really going to um, quickly absorb all of that blood. And soon enough, we'll have a situation where now we have the entire socket filled. I'm not really too worried about dead space because I know this material expands once it gets hydrated with the blood. But because of the large defect here, I went ahead and put an Ossix plus membrane right over the top very simply. And this just lays right over the top um, and conforms really well to that defect. Again, I do not want to get primary closure in these cases if I can avoid it because then I have to worry about changes to the soft tissue. And so I feel very comfortable using this combination of materials and leaving it slightly exposed. So no fancy suturing, these are uh, PTFE sutures, but again, we're not looking for primary closure. We're gonna let biology do most of the work. And at four months, you can see we have this really nice, beautiful band of thick carotinized tissue. I'm able to place my implant in that ideal position. And here's an X-ray from the date of the implant procedure. And so a lot of my cases as a periodontist, I, I'll perform the implant, I'll perform the uncovering, and the patients disappear for quite a while. And I was lucky enough to see this patient in the office just about two weeks ago. So I was able to get a really nice follow-up. Um, regardless, here's the um, final post-op appointment with my patient where I perform the uncovery right after taking this radiograph. And now here's the two-year post-op of the case restored. And you can see we have beautiful, healthy, carotinized tissue. And the x-ray revealed really stable bone results. And as you can see with the dates here, we're about two, two, almost two years post-op. And so this was really a nice result for a case where um, I, I really had a, a challenging defect to work with. Um, luckily, I had that bridge of bone, which really made me feel comfortable that I can go ahead and use something like Ossix bone that will maintain the space. Um, and then Ossix plus over the top. Um, just to help keep that material confined to the space and maybe exclude some soft tissue cells from, from growing into my defect. Okay, This scenario is the last scenario we're going to talk about, and it's something that we see every single day, placing our implants in situations where we have marginal amounts of buccal bone. And in this case, if you look closely, you can see I really had an unmeasurable amount of buccal bone here, probably less than half a millimeter. And in years past, I might try to do some particulate bone grafting. Um, I might try to do a ridge split, but I really am always looking for the easiest, most simple solutions that are also going to give me the most predictable results. And so really harnessing the benefits of the handling of this material, rather than having to use particulate, I can use this ossix bone, place it right into that buccal concavity, Again, you can actually see here very nicely how I probably manipulated that material a little bit too much when it was dry as it started to break. Um, like I mentioned earlier, there's no reason to fret that situation. Um, you just go ahead and continue on, leave that material in place. And because this is more of a ridge augmentation case where I really want this material to be stable, I will go ahead and again, use that Ossix Plus membrane over the top, excluding soft tissue cells, but also confining this material to the defect. Now, a lot of the times you'll see in my cases that I'm using periosteal stabilizing sutures. Um, this is not one of those cases. This is just a simple horizontal mattress suture. And what this suture is doing is it's um, allowing me to coronally position the flaps a bit and, and really take tension off those flap margins. Um, and at the same time, it is sort of holding my membrane down over my bone graft, um, but it's not a complicated suture. And really, it's just meant to keep tension off of my flat margins. You can see that allowed me to get really nice closure with very little tension on the flap. And then this is the four-month post-op where the patient returned and we were ready to do our uncovery. Um, at that point, we did take a cone beam CT scan, and it was really... Um, very nice for me to see that this material was clearly uh, mineralizing buckle to the implant. This was about four, four and a half months. I did my uncovery and I had to 
get a stud finder to find my implant. And so that's really something that we, we start getting used to when we're using these materials that are so biocompatible that are actually mineralizing themselves. Um, and you can see here after exposing the implant, I clearly have obtained about three to five millimeters of bone buckled to this implant. And prior to um, this procedure, again, I would have been using particular graft. I would have been using a combination of different materials to obtain this result. Um, but you can clearly see here, this is a very simple protocol to perform contour augmentation, which is not always so easy to do. Um, this is another case where I was recently able to get a great post-op on the patient. So you can see here, um, this is the uh, about two and a half year post-op where the patient's really doing very, very well. She has nice, healthy tissue. And I even have a final radiograph for, from about two and a half years. Um, if you noticed, in the meantime, we ended up having to do a additional implant on the maxillary left canine, um, but stable results at both sites, um, now two and a half year post-op. So this really gives me a lot of confidence starting to use this material in a lot broader indications. Um, I think the trickiest thing with any material is, you know, choosing cases to start with that are, are simple, that allow you to get a really good feel for the handling of the material before you start using it for more aggressive cases. Um, but I really encourage you all to give it a shot because I've been having some great results. And so thank you very much for, for inviting me here to share some of my experiences with this great material. Um, and I hope to see you soon.